A lot of times we fall into this trap that we feel like we just need to do more and more research before we get started on something new. You ever fall into that trap? Yes, both of us do. Like, oh my gosh, almost on a daily basis. It's a I common feel like. theme here on the Let's Quit podcast is yes. just the fact that we spend way too much time thinking about it and overthinking about it and researching about it, and this we is, never actually get around to doing it. Oh, it's constantly a battle that we're fighting with ourselves. Well, great. We're going to talk about it yet again here on the Let's Quit podcast. <laughs> Let's roll the intro. Welcome to the Let's Quit podcast. Quitting is not always a bad thing. If you have the right mindset, quitting can be the most powerful tool you have on your journey to success. It's certainly been helpful for us. Whether it's flying through hurricanes, building our businesses, or just trying to get to bed on time, we're always trying to level up and improve our lives. This is the show where we share the lessons, experiences, and friends that have helped us live this incredible life. So let's quit the bad and grow the good together. All right. Well, welcome to the show. I think this is episode 42 now of the Let's Quit podcast. So if you've stuck around this whole time, thanks. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I would have, but I uh, appreciate you. <laughs> it's uh, only because of your Bucky shirt. Yeah, for sure. Uh, anyway, so yeah, episode 42. Thanks so much for joining us here. Um, yeah. Man, we have been doing a lot the last couple of weeks. Literally, we sat down to record this podcast and we were like, we have so much to catch up on because I'm pretty sure where we left you last was I had just gotten back from my hurricane block and man we hit the ground running when I came home yeah well by the time that you came home I was already on day four of posting daily YouTube content which yes. man yes the answer to your question that does take a lot of time yeah um we had gotten to the point where we were posting once a week and it was a very simple, repeatable show. We did a really good job. We had no narrowed it all down where it only took us a couple hours to edit an episode. And I, frankly, I just got bored. Like Jenny was gone. I didn't really need to do a whole lot. I had to make boards, which I was procrastinating about. But like, I, I just thought like, man, if we're going to hire an employee coming up pretty soon to help with the YouTube channel, like we need to pay them. Can, if I post it every single day, can we double the amount of money that YouTube pays us? So that's been our, like, that's, I don't know, that's been, that's been our thing. That's what we've been doing for the last week. And, um, cause another one of our goals is to hit a uh, hundred K on YouTube. Like we're so close. Well, we were, we were supposed to, I say supposed to, like I'm entitled. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a millennial, <laughs> but uh, we were, according to our old metrics, like our growth pattern, we were expecting to hit a hundred K this time last year. Now, that fell apart because we had hurricane season and we did all our training and COVID. We just quit right. posting so often. But even though we recovered and we've gone almost an entire year with only skipping three or four weeks worth of videos, like our growth was just really stunted. And then we got on some weird page on the YouTube um, studio app, you know, where if you, ha if you are a YouTuber, there's a little app that you can download that shows you all your metrics, analytics and nerdy stuff. And we found some page on there we never seen before that was like, yeah, you'll hit it in six months. And we're like, excuse me, what? Uh huh? And we're like, yay. Like we were supposed to hit it six months ago. Why are we now not hitting it for another six months? And it was like, at that moment, because we, we don't complain about the algorithm. It's like one of our, it's one of our manifesto like rules. Right. Like, like you, we you, do not complain about the algorithm. You take YouTube's money, you play YouTube's game kind of a deal. Right. We've talked about this before, but like we just, oh my gosh, we were just so upset to see that like YouTube was actively throttling the growth of our channel to whatever metric they wanted us to hit. Right. I don't so know what, and they don't share that with you. That's the other thing is they don't tell you how to bust out of it. They just expect you to grind and work harder to get out of it. Now, there's a lot of complaining in there I could do, but I'm not going to because we have decided to play YouTube's game. If that's yep. what they want to do with their platform, that's, we just got to deal with it. So, so what we are doing now is posting every day until we hit 100,000. We are cramming content down that algorithm's throat until it cries uncle and gives us what we're looking for. Yes. Um, so we're sort of, we're playing their game with the rules to their game. And anyway, for a short period of time till we hit 100,000 where it would be sustainable because it's not just the YouTube revenue. We want to also be able to take on bigger sponsors. And the more content you put out, and the more views you get, the mm -hmm. more attractive you are to a sponsor. And one of the biggest thresholds is hitting 100,000. At that point, bigger sponsors start to notice and, and take you seriously. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I get like it's it's really a vanity number and we understand that. But it's, it's, but it's also a goal. It's, you know, I know it sounds like a vanity number, but... 
it also gives us something to work toward instead of like, and oh, we've yeah. never we've never had to lean on the money we made before ever. Yeah. We've just funneled it back into the business and reinvested. But now we're taking a small paycheck. We're looking at hiring somebody full time. Like there's a lot. We're getting into a commercial space, which we'll talk about. Yes. Can we just round of applause Yay. for ourselves? But um, yeah, we're starting to take it more seriously. Um, and so we're getting more serious about playing the game. And and how we view things and what motivates us is to like set a goal in front of ourselves and try mm-hmm. to hit it. And so for us, we're like, hey, 100K. I know it's kind of a vanity number, but it's a goal. And it's like within reach. So let's go for it. Yeah, and now we want to push ourselves to make good content, put out videos daily. Um, and we're learning a lot from it too. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you saw the video, but we posted a video with a thumbnail of us just holding a piece of paper that said every day till hundred K we're trying to post every single weekday until we hit that number. Who knows if we'll pull it off or we might crash and burn in glory, but, um, I don't know. I, it, it looks like it's working just today. There's, there's an upward trend on our subscriber numbers, which there wasn't the first week we did this. We got fewer subscribers than normal. Well, what we're learning now too, is that if we want to try something new with the channel, we have to stick with it for at least three weeks to see if there's even any sort of like outcome. Right. If we see any change, good or bad, that's about how long it takes. And we're on like week two. So we still have another like week, week and a half to see if this is even making a difference for us. Right. And then the backside of that, if it doesn't work or it's, we determined by our standard of me- of measuring that it, it's not worth it then we back off and then youtube's going to punish us because we're not posting as often anymore so it's a double-edged sword but at this point in time it, it was a great chance for us just to experiment which is what we talked about last week and, and these just... are kind of more the style of videos that we've been wanting to make oh yeah anyway oh, we're just yeah. making a higher volume of oh it's them. we've we've had some not so nice comments recently of people like i didn't subscribe to watch you go grocery shopping or like you're like jenny's coming home jenny's been gone for two weeks and you're not excited about jenny coming home you're like i'm sorry i don't want you watching our content our content is not for you if that's the case like yeah. if all you want us to do is build things and show you how we did it and maybe throw a pricing structure so you can argue with us, so bye bye. You can argue with us. Oh, that's so true. Bye bye. <laughs> Don't want you. Don't need you. Anyways, I would rather have I would rather have a thousand people watch me eat a peanut butter sandwich than a hundred thousand people think that I'm a one trick pony. Yeah, and it's just and it's been interesting because a lot of people are like I subscribe for the building. And we're like, that's funny because our channel's never been 100% about building either. Well, um, and I mean, we talked about this in depth the other day, but like if you ask a fish what bait he wants, he will ask you for the bait without a hook, yeah. but then you'll never catch a fish. So asking a YouTube audience what they want to see is the biggest way to lose your audience because they don't know what they want. Right. Everybody says they hate clickbait, but they, they click on it. I am a YouTuber myself. I know what clickbait is. I write it like multiple times during the week and I see a video out there and I still click it. I know what it is. I, I know it. how to manufacture it and it still works on me. Right. But anyway, you don't need to ask. Don't ask the fish. Ask the fisherman. Yes. And the yes. fisherman is saying experiment, try new things yep. and uh, do what we're doing now. So yep. anyway, that's enough about YouTube. Man, yes. This is not the YouTube podcast. No. <laughs> um, on that last note, we got some pickles merch uh, yes. started. So uh, a lot of people are eating that up. So, so before- okay. If you don't know, our intro on all of our YouTube videos is um, we're talking about how we have, you know, big goals. We want to expand. Known, they've the seen, nobody listens to okay, this okay. podcast who doesn't know that we have a YouTube I'm just making channel. sure. Sometimes I'm really bad at like not backing up and giving yeah, people context. Anyways, when we say big goals, some people think it sounds like pickles. And so we made some pickle merch. Um, with sunglasses. It's a pretty snazzy shirt. Funny. I'm yeah. not going to lie. Yeah. And we, because I don't know, it's all coming at this time where we have like really big goals that we're working toward right now. We want to get into a commercial space. That's a huge goal. We want to hit 100,000 on YouTube. That's another big goal. And so we just thought it was the perfect time to come out with merch that had to do with big goals. Um, yep. So yeah, if you want that, check it out. Um, go to our website, jennyanddavis.com. We can also put a link here in the show notes um, to get the Pickles merch. It's not just a shirt. It's a phone case and a coffee mug. We put it on all the things that you look at most. To remind you of your big goals or your pickles as they were yes so um on that note we are we've teased it a little bit we have been making progress on our commercial space yeah uh we went and viewed some spaces yesterday yeah. i don't know like depending on this kind of, like it's kind of funny the podcast used to update people on what was happening but now the youtube content is now ahead of the podcast yeah that is crazy so you have seen more about the commercial space stuff than, than we know now oh <gasps> 
Do-do-do-do-do. Right, because you're going to have seen a couple videos that we haven't edited yet. Twilight Zone. This up in is here. weird. I don't like this. Anyway, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> It's out of my comfort zone, which means we're growing, which is good. Which is good. Oh, but so, we've had a blast looking at these. Oh, it's been spaces. so much fun. And out of this week of looking at spaces and and because we have been, we've been. It's like I don't know if you guys play around with Zillow in your house or anything, but like we have been playing around on the commercial real estate version of Zillow. It's called LoopNet, um, all one word. We've been playing around on that website for what a year and a half now. Yeah, just looking at what's out there, yep. what's available to us, and. It's just been crazy to finally go into some of these places and physically with our eyeballs look at what it looks like. And nothing can prepare you for that. Like no amount of pictures, no amount of like anything. And it's uh, it's just crazy. Like You do. You just you just have to go do it after a while. We can spend hours and hours and hours looking at them and you're like, well, do you think 3,000 square feet is enough? Well, what about 6,000? How much bigger really is 5,000 than 3,000 square feet? Like how much bigger is it really? Um, but then when you get to go walk them, you're like, oh my gosh, this is so much space. We walked into the very first one that was like 3,000 square feet. No, it was six, like, the first one was 6,000. Oh, and then huge. the second one. Yeah, it felt massive. And then I, I just remember that even the 3,000 one feeling big though. Too. Yeah, I it didn't. Just, oh, my, you didn't? My brain was playing tricks on me. So we saw the 6,000 square foot one first. And then we went into a 3,500 square foot one. And my brain was instantly like, no, this is way too small. How is oh, this really? going to work? Yeah, like See, I was brain, falling into the trap. When I walked into the first one, I was like, oh my gosh, this is way too big. What would we even do with this? I'm like, I guess it's good to see, like just for reference of how big it is. And yeah. then we walked into the 3,500 square foot one. And I was like, this is more like it. I feel like I yeah. can well, actually what, fill this space. What finally pulled me back into reality was... Um, I pictured our planer. I was like, what's our biggest tool? It's our big 20 inch grizzly planer. And I thought, what does, what would that look like in here? And when I realized that if it was against the wall on the other side of the the building, it would look like a little lunchbox planer. (laughs) It would, yeah, it would look like somebody left their lunchbox in the corner. Like it's just, these buildings are just massive. The scale just doesn't translate on video. So, um, Anyway, just going and physically seeing it, seeing how big that these spaces are. And I like, even when our, our broker was trying to tell us like how big a conference room should be, and he was like stepping it off. Of course, with the high ceilings and everything, I'm like, that's such a dinky, tiny little room. And then we go see another one where the where the conference room is the size he told me. And I was like, whoa, this place is huge. Yeah. It's just your perspective is totally off uh, when you start looking at different uh, spaces. And then our, our other video that came out that you guys will see is us like drawing out the sizing we want and like the layout of all the rooms. That's when it gets deceiving too, because you're like, oh well, do you really only want a 12 foot long like conference room? That's and huge. Then, I know, and then it's just it, again, it gets all distorted, and it's yeah. Yeah, I mean this this tiny little office that we have right here is a what a 10 by 10 room basically. Right, and we're over here like 12 feet is way too small for an office, and I'm like, we have a desk that holds both of us, three, five computers in here, four cameras. Right. Well, so a, here's here's the kicker, like. You've probably seen the layout video by now. All of the office layouts we were looking at were about a thousand square feet of Mm -hmm. office space. We've been running the woodworking business and the media business out of 700 square feet total. That's the garage, this room, the next room, and behind the sofa in the living room. All that combined is 700 square feet. And we're over here saying, oh, a thousand square feet of office space might not be enough. Like, (laughs) we're just, we're being babies. It's just, it's one of those things, and we just keep learning this lesson over and over and over, is like you can do all the research you want, but that doesn't tell you what it feels like or what it's going to be like to actually use that space. Right. Which is the perfect segue into today's title topic. So we'll play the little jingle and we'll pick it up on the other side. All right, Jenny, hit him with the quote. Okay, today's quote is, and I'm kind of confused why we haven't put in a quote from him yet, because... We love him and we read yeah, so much of his like, stuff. I don't know. I don't know. I know everybody knows his quotes, but still, I'm like, geez. All right, here we go. Ugh. Okay, the quote this week is from Tony Robbins, and it says, the only impossible journey is the one you never begin, which sounds kind of cliche, right? Well, the, oh, you know, a journey begins, a journey of a thousand steps begins with one step or, you know, whatever. But like, think about it, really. Was that Neil Armstrong? Oh, uh, sure. I don't remember. Um, and uh, African proverb. Yes. <laughs> it's a proverb from somewhere. Um but it is the thing that you never do is the thing that never gets done. Like the only impossible yeah. thing is the thing you never do. Duh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yet it's so hard to believe because it, it's like, well, I, I did a lot of research and I, I'm looking into it. I'm thinking about it, but I don't know if it'll be right for me. And it's yeah. like, well, it's definitely not right for you if you never 
try it. Yeah. So let's back up. Let's give our definition of what we mean in the show. So today's clickbait title uh, is quit researching. Um, and what we mean by that is we mean to take action instead of consuming more content. And that's what we're calling research. Uh, sometimes an experiment, you might consider that research, but like what we're talking about in this context is research is just passively consuming content from other experts, watching people do it, uh, not, not an active participation in the research process. So what we mean is get out there and start trying. Make your research like physically doing things, trying and failing, trying and failing. And it's just so obvious when people don't do this. Like people just wring their hands asking a thousand questions. It's like, have you ever tried to do a push-up? Like you're asking me about the form and like what angle my arm should be and like how to carry your weight. And like you're asking all these in-depth questions. But it's like, have you ever done a push-up? Well, no, I'm not. I'm waiting to get the perfect form before I try. And it's like, okay. Like, dude, you just have to do a push-up. <laughs> right. So it, translate that to woodworking. We get a lot of DMs and stuff on Instagram of people just like, I don't know how to sell my work. I don't know how to price it. And then like, how am I supposed to personalize it? And should I buy a laser engraver? Should I get a branding iron? And I'm like, have you ever sold anything ever to anybody? And they're like, no, I'm waiting to, for everything to be perfect. Or I'm waiting for my shop. That's the number one thing. He's like, oh, I'm waiting for my shop to be set up first. And I'm like, yo, we got people in the stud stack making 10 grand a month and they're working under a carport. They don't even have like, they don't a even shop. They don't even have a shop. They're running extension cords to the neighbor's house because they're tripping breakers on their own pants. Like, oh my gosh, you and do not need to get everything perfect before you start. Yeah. That is a loser mentality. And I don't mean that in a harsh or mean way. I mean that in a, you are you're following the wrong trail and we want to help people to start doing their research by taking action instead of just sitting there passively consuming content till they feel like they're full enough to get started right because we have that sickness too oh and my we gosh actively, so badly. we have to actively fight against it so it yes. just hurts when we see somebody else doing what we do naturally right so we're like no like come along and, and try this new thing with me because I have the same problem. Um, so it just kills us to, to, to see it like in the outside world and, and we have to work so hard to make it, you know, work in ours. Right. So today we're going to go through a little list of can and can'ts. Yes. Uh, it's going to be something new instead of a one, two, three point sermon. It's going to be a few, th just a few points, like what research can do and what research can't do. And again, we're talking about passive research. Because it's not all research is bad. Right. It's just there's a definite point in time. Or there's just limits to what passive research can give you. Right. And once you've spent a couple hours on something passively researching it, okay, now it's time to try. So step number one, thing number one, I want to ring the bell, but it's not an action step. <laughs> nope. It's just a thing. We need another sound for, uh, I don't know. Research, number one, research can help you learn the new language of a niche. So what I mean by that is every hobby, every venture has its own list of jargon, its terms, its definitions. Uh, Gary V talks about this. AVE talks about this. Most of your like beginning stages of researching are just learning how to speak the language. This is what a bachelor's degree does for you. Mm -hmm. um, like you're not going to be some brainiac whiz kid that comes in and like disrupts an entire industry just because you got a bachelor's degree in underwater basket weaving. That's just so you can get up to speed with the conversation. And then if you want to focus on a more critical area, at least in the field of science, you go get a master's degree and you focus a little more. And if you really want to be the expert on something, you go get a PhD on that subsection of the, mm -hmm. the niche. And then you're, you're the expert in whatever that niche is. Right. And then you can collaborate with other people at that level to do something huge, right? Right. Well, um, you can like this is also in woodworking. Like how often oh, how much time did you spend just learning what rough like S3S lumber? Right. You either know what that means or you don't know what that means. And yes, passive research is going to teach you what that means. Um, I did this a lot with rock climbing, too. Oh, yeah. I would try to like watch YouTube videos of all these super good people rock climbing. And, and they'd be don't... like, they'd be like, yeah, this you, you got to grab that sloper up there. And then there's a crimp right above that. I'm thinking about and that I'm vine. Like, you remember what? that vine of that surfer dude? It was like on the news. Oh, like, yeah. First you got to go whoop -hoo! and then flip back. Would you whoop -hoo! <laughs> yes, and he's got like not even using technical terms, just using noises. Oh my um, god! But I'm sure another surfer knows exactly what that guy's saying, yeah. even though he's not using words. Like it's the same thing in any industry. You got to learn and get up to speed with the language. Research is really, really good to to help you with yeah. that. So if you try, if you come across an article or you hear advice from your buddy that tells you to do something and you don't know what in the world he means, start googling those search terms. Right? You can find that out on your own, and you can learn the language. Yeah. Um, 
So that's one of the things research can do. Research cannot... I do have a sound for that. <laughs> research cannot help you uh, get experience in doing something. Like I mentioned earlier with push-ups, passive research will not teach you what it's like to do a push-up. Or what it feels like. Uh, reading or watching Doug DeMuro reviews of cars on YouTube is not going to teach you what it's like to drive that car. Mm-hmm. Until you grip the steering wheel and slam on the brakes or make a turn or pull out from a stoplight, you're not going right. to know what it's like to drive that car. Right. And that's why so much of our Air Force training, I feel like, is has been like putting yeah. us into that situation, especially survival school. Because we can oh go through gosh. PowerPoints all day long and say, oh, when you're in the woods and you're abandoned, eat these leaves, but not these. And you're going to see this on the trail. But until you're actually out there and you're lost and you're hungry, like... You know, you're not going to know right. how you're going to react or, or even some of the, like. Even some of the more intense stuff where they like, I don't know, how much can we share? Like, <laughs> they are, oh, I don't even know. Like, let's just, there are definitely some things that you do not know what they are physically going to feel like unless <laughs> you physically feel them. Was it Mike Tyson says? Everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the mouth. Yes. that's. <laughs> Everybody's got an idea of how you would behave in a like... A very intense situation. Kidnapping scenario till you get hit in the mouth. Then your true colors come yes. out. And that's all I'm going to say about that. It's just... And, and like, we're crazy because we're smiling right now. Everybody else who's gone through this training is probably dreading it. But like, w until you get shaken up a little bit, you don't know what's actually going to happen. Yeah. You don't know how your body responds. And you got to go through it a few times until you can get the wiggles out. You can build up a callus to that. And then you can think clearly with your prefrontal cortex instead of your stupid animal brain that just gets angry and hungry. Yes. On a much lighter note, an example of this would be when we went to the big um, aquarium in Atlanta at For Workbench work Con. Con. Speaking of which, get your Workbench Con tickets. We're yeah. going to be there. I'm excited. I'm stoked. Stud Stack's showing up in a big way. A bunch yeah. of people bought their tickets too. So. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. I saw it this morning. I'm stoked. Um, but yeah, so we were like, we got to work bench con a couple of days early and we're like, what should we do? And there was a really cool aquarium right next to the hotel. And so I'm doing research. I'm like, oh, these look like really cool pictures. Look at all these fish. Oh, they have dolphins. Cool. And so, you know, we went, bought tickets, started touring it. And I walked through this tunnel and like a 15 foot manta ray, like swam over our heads in yeah. this glass tunnel. And I was like, whoa, couldn't get that from online. Like the tingles that just go through your arms. I almost got like goosebumps just being able to see that. And I'm like, I would have never known. Not from a video, not from yeah. a, not from an article, nothing. Like, I had to go to this museum and actually experience it to see what it was all about. And I'm sure that doesn't even relate to the feeling if you're actually free diving and you have something like, because right. that's a different experience too. Like, yeah, I pet a little stingray in the little aquarium, like, you know, petting zoo. Pet, petting zoo. <laughs> um, but like, that was cool. But like, that didn't feel nearly as exhilarating as like swimming next to a stingray when we were in the Virgin Islands. Right. That's like, a different type That's a of whole thing. different yeah. feeling. So anyway, like, I guess that's just what we're trying to say. Research can't give you the experience in doing mm -hmm. something. It cannot give you repetitions in something that you need to build up a resistance or a strength with. Yes. And so the next thing that research can do, research can point you in the right direction. Yeah. It, it does a really good job of, of saying, hey, you might want to go this way for these reasons. Right. We thought of college. Yeah. So like whether you have been to college or your, your family members or somebody has gone to college, like we've struggled with that decision of like, okay, where do we go? And there's a lot of logical reasons that you can find online. Hey, they have my degree program. They're in the same state as me. My parents went. I can get a scholarship to go there. My friend is also going there. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of reasons that like through research, you can figure out why you might want to go. But, like... Nothing's going to tell you more about that college than walking the campus. Right. Getting the vibe. Feel of feel what it's like to be there. And that's why college campuses do tours. That it's, like it's, a, it's a normal thing. I'm going on a campus tour, you know, this weekend. I'm going to go stay there for a couple of days and see what it's like. Right. So, again, research just... It, it can't... It can point you in the right direction, but again, it can't give you that experience of what it's like right. to try it. It can't so, tell you which path to take. But it can tell best. you what direction, what cardinal direction to yes. go. 
you just can't ask it to uh, point out your steps. So that's the next, that's the last thing. Research can't tell you which path to take is the best. Mm -hmm. It can't tell you what the best career path is. It can't tell you what your work-life balance should be. It like, uh, we sum these all up as like adult problems. I don't know. I just like, in my late teens, early twenties, I thought that like, ouch, that hurt to say. Um, I, I like had this realization that Google no longer could answer my questions. Right. When it was like interpersonal stuff, or if it was like, what decision should I make for the rest of my life? What degree should I get? Like Google can't answer those questions. That's a real grown up problem. And I'm sorry, like you can sit there and you can research, you can you can distract yourself with, with research, but until you make a decision and start trying stuff, like you're not going to find out what your next step mm -hmm. should be. Um, you either need to take wise counsel from a physical human being, which again, that's just another, that's a little bit more active type of research, but you really just need to take it, take action and try something. Mm -hmm. Go taste it and see if you like it. Right. That's why Gary Vee says, try a million different things, yep. a million different things and figure out what you like. Because that's going to be way faster than sitting there passively consuming stuff right. while you're doing nothing. Kind of right. like the quote says, like, the more you research, the less you're doing. Yeah. So, Yeah. Cuts right to my soul. I know. Ouch. I know. Because we both love research. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. We love it so much. And we always feel obligated to do more of it. And we know you guys feel the same. But at the end of the day, if you didn't take action or you didn't make progress on it, it's just you're just wasting your time and That's effort. That's how I felt about these commercial spaces, too. It's like we've been researching them for so long. And I would love nothing more than to sit here for another three months and just organize all of Put this. them in a spreadsheet yeah. and see them and co cost comparisons yep. and negotiate. Like we could send our realtor or we, or we could send our broker out and be like, hey, go find out what the actual leasing rate is on this Get, and come back to us with the lowest offer. And we could sit there and organize in a spreadsheet. We could. But imagine in that amount of time, you can't even do that because in that same amount of time, people are going to buy them from out under or rent them from out under you. Right. They're not but, even going to be available anymore. Right. Before you get your master spreadsheet full of properties, they're all going to be leased out and you're just going to have to keep doing the whole thing over again. And right. you're never going to move into you a get place. this feedback loop of inaction. Mm. So what do I do, Jenny, if I'm stuck? If this resonates with me and I do too much research, what are my action steps? <laughs> Let me tell you, it does resonate with us. And these are legitimately our action steps. All right. Number one. So the first one is identify the areas you've been researching instead of taking action. So is there like an area in your life where you find yourself constantly watching YouTube videos on it or doing Google searches or whatever, but you're not actually doing any of it? Right. And not just for entertainment purposes. Like you actually have a goal or a dream right, to do right. this. Like, I mean, I watch... I watch Matt's off road. I watch him like pull vehicles out of the sand all the time and how he does it. But like, I'm never going to go do that. Right, right. That's just entertainment. So for me, I guess one that I was able to like point out a couple months ago is skincare routines. That's like a really big thing on YouTube right now. People are like documenting what they like to use, like which moisturizers anyways. And so I was watching a bunch of these videos because like I should probably start taking care of my skin. Like I'm not old, but I'm also like not super yeah, I like, I don't know. Anyways, I just want to take better care of myself. So I watch a bunch well, of these starts, videos. I mean, your long-term health begins when you're in your early 20s. Right. And that's what I started realizing is if I want like really nice skin when I'm older, I got to take care of it now. Um, and so I started watching these videos and I was like, oh, I could try that or that or that. And then I'd find myself watching like 25 different videos. I'm like, no, that probably wouldn't work for me. No, that probably would be too harsh on my skin. I'm like, how did I know? I didn't test out any of these things. And so I finally just got to the point where I'm like... You know what? Like, doing nothing is really terrible for your skin. Exactly. So. And so then I was like, you know, maybe I should go out and like just try some of these before I, you know, watch 15 more videos and, and waste another two hours of my time. Mm. Relatable content as always, Jenny. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, what's the second one? Uh, so first off is identify what areas you've been... Having a goal in, but you're not making progress. Correct. And the second one is? Fail at something. Like choose just, just choose to fail. And fail. Choose to fail. Teach yourself that it's not that scary mm -hmm. to fail. If, you've, if you think you need to do more research on something, just go try it first. Mm -hmm. Accept the fact that you're going to fail and just say, look, I'm going to learn more from failing than I am sitting on my butt reading more yes. articles. Absolutely. Just go out there, buy some crypto. Go out there. That's not financial advice. Go out there, <laughs> buy some crypto. Go out there and invest in some stocks or go out there, ask the girl out, uh, whatever. Like, again, like none of this is... This is prescribed like yes, <laughs> advice um, conceptually go get the girl like do do the thing, you know, you're going to fail at and then just say, you know what? I learned a lot about that yeah. because you're going to realize that learning 
in the physical world is much faster than learning out of a textbook or off of Google. Yeah. So it still has its place, but at some point you just got to light a fire under your butt and make it happen. Again, not prescribed literal advice. Don't actually light a fire. Oh, no, actually butt. light a fire under your butt if that's <laughs> what you need. And sit on it. <laughs> Follow me for more workout routines. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right, y'all. Thanks so much for listening, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Bye.